Welcome everybody. My name is George Dunlap, and I work for Citrix on the uh, the Zen Project at Org team. And uh, today we're going to be talking about how to secure your cloud with Zen's advanced security features. So, <clears throat> Zen is an open source, enterprise grade, Type One hypervisor that was uh, designed for the cloud before it was called the cloud. So. Um, <clears throat> The Xeno Servers Project at the University of Cambridge uh, back in the early 2000s envisioned a world where anybody could uh, rent their CPU space to arbitrary pe other people on the, on the, uh, across the internet. And uh, they designed Zen specifically with that idea in mind to be a very lightweight uh, but very secure system. So uh, <coughs> Zen has a lot of advanced security features, but many of them are not, uh, are not or cannot be enabled by default. And a number of them seem, when you first look at them, kind of complicated, even though, in fact, they're not that difficult to, to implement. So my goal for this talk is to give you guys um, some tools to think about security in Zen uh, so that you will know some of the security features that Zen has and to be equipped with the basic knowledge to be able to get them working. In order to accomplish those goals, uh, we're going to cover these things. So we're going to give a brief overview of the Zen architecture. <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the principles of security analysis. Uh, and then we're going to consider some attack surfaces and some Zen features that we can use to um, make those services more secure. These, uh, um, some of these features we're going to talk about will include driver domains, pvgrub, uh, stub domains, um, we're going to compare PV versus HVM and uh, the Flask example policy. And um, I found that using man pages is a bit like a dictionary, right? So you can use the dictionary to, to show you how to, um, to find the spelling of a word if you already have a very good idea of how, of how it's spelled. Um, so a man page is very similar. You have to have an idea of what the overall solution looks like before you, reading the man page makes any sense. So I just want to give you a brief overview of what the solution looks like so that when you come to the man pages, when you come to the documentation, um, it's easier for you to uh, get a handle on things. Right, <clears throat> so start with the Zen architecture. Zen is a type one hypervisor, which means um, it runs directly on the, on the hardware, not next to or on top of another operating system. It is a microkernel style hypervisor, so it only controls the CPU, the memory, and the interrupts. Um, and uh, it offloads the hardware drivers to uh, guest VMs. Now, um, an instance of a running VM is then is called a domain. And the first domain that Zen starts when it boots up is called domain zero. Domain zero typically contains the hardware drivers to drive the hardware as well as um, the tool stack to allow you to create, destroy, and manage uh, other VMs in the system. Um, now this can be, typically it would be Linux, but it can be any operating system which is ported to Zen. So NetBSD currently is supported to Zen. And um, back when OpenSolaris was still being maintained, OpenSolaris could actually be run as a, as a DOM zero as well. Zen has two different kinds of uh, guests. Um, the first, the PV guests and HVM guests are fully virtualized guests. So, Para-virtualized guests are Zen's major contribution to the field of virtualization. So back when Zen was invented, um, hardware virtualization, the hardware extensions had not been implemented by Intel and AMD yet. They hadn't been published. And so um, virtualizing x86 architecture was very difficult because there are a number of instructions that behave differently depending on whether you are in ring 0, ring 1, or ring uh, 3. And so um, the state of the art at that time, before pair virtualization, was something called binary translation, which was incredibly complicated and still, in many cases, very slow. Zen's contribution was to say, well, <clears throat> what if, um, instead of trying to, what we're doing here is we're, we have a piece of software with a hypervisor talking to a piece of software, which is the operating system, but we're using an interface defined by this hardware. What if we made a software interface and we got rid of all the things that were hard to, hard to virtualize and let the guest operating system know that it was running on a hypervisor and gave it a software interface? And so they um, ripped out anything that was difficult to virtualize uh, for x86 and replaced it with a software interface. And the result was a very fast, slimmed down um, hypervisor that had very good performance. <clears throat> Um, one of the things for this talk that's important is um, how they did the uh, device driver. So rather than try and emulate uh, some kind of a device driver, they came up with what's called the split driver model. So you have a, a, something um, 
the piece of software which provides access to the hardware, um, so the net virtual hardware networker block, is called the back end. And the piece, the piece of software which consumes it is called the front end. Um, and these share um, rings uh, to communicate with each other. Um, so we have net back and block back, which run in domain zero and provide the service. And we have net front and block front, which run in the uh, guest domain and consume the service. But of course, uh, only a few years after Zen uh, was made public, then Z Intel and AMD have published their uh, virtualization extensions, um, which Zen can now use to uh, invent a new kind of, I mean, to use a new kind of domain called a fully virtualized or HVM domain, where you can run unmodified guest operating systems. Um, <clears throat> so the HVM extensions allow you to virtualize the processor, but you still need to have an emulated motherboard, emulated disk and network controller, and so on. Um, and to do that, rather than um, reinvent the wheel, uh, we kind of do what KVM did, is we, and we use QMU to run the device model for uh, these various devices. And the QMU typically will run inside of domain zero. OK. <clears throat> so security. Uh, the first thing you need to do when you're thinking about security is to define your threat model. What is it you're actually trying to protect against? Um, what do you assume that your attacker is able to do? So in our example, we're going to assume the attacker can access the guest network to send packets to it. And we're going to assume that he controls one guest operating system. This may be because the attacker has compromised one of your customer's uh, operating systems, or it may be because um, the attacker is one of your customers. And he's going to, he controls one guest operating system, he's going to try and break out of that and, and attack um, other operating systems. So unfortunately, so vulnerabilities, the ability to break into the things, come from bugs. And unfortunately, we have not figured out how to write bug-free software uh, yet. And so if there was a, a bug, um, an exploitable vu vulnerability that allows someone to gain more access than you intended them to have, then an attacker can um, break in. And so it's not a matter of secure or not secure. It's a matter of more secure or less secure, where more secure means there's a lower probability that there is a bug, and less secure means there's a high probability that there is a bug. So to compare two things, to say if it's more secure than that, we can um, ask a couple of different questions. So the first question is, how much of the code is accessible? If we assume that each bug, each, each line of code, has a very small probability of having an exploitable vul vulnerability in it, then the more lines of code that you can light up, the higher the probability the attacker is going to, to have find in one of those lines of code some way to attack and escalate his privileges. The next question to ask is, what is the interface like? Is it really complicated, like this one? Was it really simple, like this one? <clears throat> the more complicated the interface, um, the more likely it is that the programmer is going to get it wrong, and there's going to be some exploitable vulnerability that an attacker can use to um, break into your system. The next thing to think about is something called defense in depth. So if you imagine if you have a castle wall, and you just have one wall, then the attacker, and someone's attacking it, they're going to break into the weakest point of that wall. And once they get it across the wall, then basically they have the run of the whole, the whole place. And so a lot of castles you'll see have two walls, right? So that after you do all the work to actually break through the one wall, you're still not done, and then you have to have break through yet another wall, right? And so this picture here is um, minus Turith, which is Tolkien's fictional city that had seven walls. And how this applies to software is what you want it to be is so that um, um, rather than just being able to cross one boundary and have one bug and then be able to have everything that you want in the system, you want, to be able to, you want it to be the case that they have to cross several boundaries because each time they cross a boundary into a new part of the software, um, then they need yet another bug. And the chances of having two bugs, exploitable bugs, is exponentially less than the chance of handling only one bug. And we'll see how this applies in some of our examples. Okay, so for our example system that we're going to analyze, um, we're going to have two networks, the control network and the guest network. We're going, you have to have an IMMU with interrupt remapping, so either any AMD system or uh, an Intel VT version 2. Um, and we're going to start with the default configuration, which will be the network drivers are going to be in DOM0. Uh, the PVGRESS are going to use PyGrub. I'm going to describe what PyGrub is in a minute. Um, and the HMU guests are going to have the QMU, the device model, running in domain 0. Let's take a look at our first uh, attack surface. So the first attack surface is the network path. So how might someone break in here? So there may be bugs in the hardware network driver. There may be bugs in the bridging or the filtering code. Um, and there may be bugs in the netback via the ring protocol. Now, netback is a very simple interface, relatively low chance of there being a bug there. 
Um, but IP tables and the bridging code are very, very complicated, and there is fairly non-negligible chance that there is some kind of exploitable bug somewhere in there. And if they do break in, well, what does that buy you? Well, it buys you control of the domain zero kernel. All of these things run in domain zero uh, in the kernel level. And because domain zero is a trusted kernel, it has to have access to be able to control the entire rest of the system. It basically controls you, gives you control of the whole system. And I want to point out that this is not just a problem for Zen, right? So any, um, uh, any virtualization technology that has these things running in a privileged space, which is most of them, um, KVM, uh, Hyper-V, VMware, are all going to have the same basic problem. So this problem is not unique, the problem is not unique, unique to Zen, but the solution is. So the solution is something called driver domains. So a driver domain is an unprivileged VM, which is given access to one piece of hardware, and then provides that access to the guests. Um, yeah, so now an exploit buys you, if you manage to break out of the rogue domain into the driver domain, all you have is control of this, of this VM. Now, that does give you a, a further base to, to make further attacks, right? So now you have, if the previous domain was an HVM domain, now you have a PV domain that you can try and attack through, right? Um, you have, now you have control of all the guest network traffic. You have control of the physical NIC. So now you can actually um, try to break into Zen or into DOM0 using the, uh, through the IOMU system, okay? Um, or you can try and break into the net front of the other, the other domain. But the point is that you have to have yet another exploitable bug. And so this is the whole idea of defense and depth, right? Is that in or now, in order to actually get something you want, you have to have two exploitable bugs instead of one. And so the system should be much more secure. So driver domains are fairly simple to set up. Um, there's a lot of individual steps, but it's not too complicated. Um, it's very similar to setting up domain zero, um, the networking domain zero. So you begin by just creating a VM with the appropriate drivers. So the same distro that you use for domain zero should be just fine. Um, you install, you make sure that you have installed the Zen related hot plug scripts. And the easiest way to do that is just to install the, the same Zen um, package in the driver domain as you did in domain zero. Um, and then you give the VM access to the physical NIC via PCI pass through. And that again takes a lot of steps, but it's very straightforward, well understood process. And then you configure the topology in the, in the driver domain just like you would for domain zero. Now you have a driver domain, and to use it, uh, you simply configure the guest VF um, to use the new domain ID. So for instance, if you've named your domain domnet, then you add backend equals domnet to the VIF declaration, like this. Okay, so you just add that at the end there. And then um, that VIF will use that backend. Okay. And uh, there's a lot more information, including step-by-step -step instructions and links to how to set up PCI pass-through and all that stuff on this uh, wiki page. Um, and, and at the end, I'm going to have a link to a page that will have sublinks to all of the all of the wiki pages on all of these these things. So, um, right. Okay. So the next attack surface, um, PyGrub. So what is what is PyGrub? So Grub is a PyGrub is a Grub implementation for PV guests. It's a Python program which runs in domain zero, and it will read the guest file system parse the guest grub.conf and then present a menu. And then based on the results of that menu um, or the defaults in the grub.conf, it will um, pull the kernel image and the NRD to the domain builder, which will then um, unpack those and put them in the domain's memory, ready to um, execute and start the domain. So if we assume that the attacker controls the guest disk, right, how can he uh, break in? So there may be bugs in the file system parser in PyGrub. Uh, there may be bugs in the menu parser. Um, there may be bugs in the domain builder in the part that parses the kernel or in it already image. And again, if you break in, um, what does that buy you? Well, it buys you control the domain zero privileged user space. And because this user space needs to be able to read and write the guest memory, it basically gives you control over um, more or less the whole system. So one way you can mitigate this problem is which might be called a security practice is called um, fixed kernels. So rather than using PyGrub, um, you enforce it that you, you only use a no, pass a known good kernel from domain zero. And this completely re removes the avenue of attack for um, the attacker to attack the domain builder or, or the, uh, the system. However, this has some disadvantages, right? So to begin with, now you as the host admin have to keep up with all the kernel security updates and stuff, which is kind of a, a pain in the neck. Uh, and furthermore, it's a lot less flexible because now a guest admin can't pass in kernel parameters, they can't pass in custom kernels or anything like this. So this is not quite so good. 
So there's another feature that Zen has um, that allows you to get the best of both worlds, which is called PVGrub. Okay? So PVGrub is MiniOS plus a PV port of Grub that runs inside the guest context. So if, if you, any of you guys are familiar with OSV, MiniOS is kind of like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a similar idea. It's just a very small operating system that runs only on Zen and doesn't have a user kernel mode um, separation and provides a really basic libc uh, functionality. <clears throat> and you can only run one uh, like single threaded applications. So the PV grub will, uh, so this is essentially the PV equivalent of the HVM's BIOS plus grub, right? So you're reading the guest disk, executing the menu, and then loading the kernel in the PV context. And so now an exploit buys you control of your own VM. And um, pvgrub is really simple to set up. The main thing is just to make sure that you actually have the pvgrub image. Um, so it's called pvgrub-arch. This would be either x86 underscore 32 or x86 underscore 64. Uh, normally lives here. Um, it's included in the Fedora Zen packages. Unfortunately, it's not included in the Debian-based Zen packages, um, including Ubuntu, downstreams like Ubuntu. So um, if you're using those, you'll have to build the image yourself. But once you have the image, um, you put it in the right place, and then you just use that um, as the kernel for the guest config, like this. Um, and then um, when you start the VM, it'll start load up pygrub, uh, sorry, pvgrub. Pvgrub will um, then k-exec the kernel that, that you choose as the result of the menu. Um, and there's a wiki page uh, here where you can find links to more information. <clears throat> okay, so the next uh, attack surface that we're going to consider is uh, QEMU the device model. So how might someone break in? There may be bugs in the, um, the, the network interface card emulator, um, and there may be bugs in the emulation of the virtual devices so that an attacker from the guest operating system may be able to break into QMU that way. And if they do, um, again, because um, QMU has to be able to read and write other guests' memory, um, we have its DOM zero privilege user space, and so it gets you pretty much control of the whole system. Um, and this is not actually a hypo it's not a hypothetical um, scenario because uh, in part of the preparation for this talk, I went back over the security um, things that we've uh, vulnerabilities that we published in the last um, two years for Zen, and there have been three exploitable bugs in the QEMU emulator. Now, none of them have been in devices which have been on by default. Okay, so um, uh, two of them have been in the E1000 network card emulator. Um, which the, it defaults to one of the RTL emulators. And one of them has been in a, a SCSI um, emulator, which is, again, not on my default. But the point is that this is possible, um, and it, it may happen. It's a risk. And this is not a, a problem that is unique to Zen, right? So anyone, um, anyone that's using QMU would also be, like KVM, would be um, susceptible to these bugs. And anyone who is doing an emulation service, um, whether uh, Hyper-V or uh, VMware, may have the same kind of risks. So the problem is not unique to them, but the solution is. So uh, there's a security feature called QMU stub domains. And a stub domain is a small service domain that runs just one application. Okay. Um, again, it runs on mini OS. And the QMU stub domain is um, when you run where each VM will have uh, 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 it, each VM will have a domain that runs alongside it that just services um, QMU. And now, um, an exploit buys you control of the stubdom VM, which, uh, since it's a PV um, interface, does actually get you a few more interfaces to attack, but not really that much. And I think that was it. Yeah, so and again, it's this idea of um, uh, defense and depth, right? So now, in order to break through the system, you need actually two exploitable vulnerabilities instead of just one. <clears throat> so QME stub domains are also fairly simple to set up. Um, this is the basic, same basic idea. You need to make sure that you have the image first. Um, it's called IOMU dash, and then the architecture. Lives in pretty much the same place. Um, it's included in this Fedora Z packages, not the Debian packages. Um, and uh, once you know that you have it, and it's in the right place where the tool stack knows where it is, you just need to specify stub domains in your guest config um, like this. And you can find much more information about stub domains, including links to how to, how to build it and so on, if you're running Debian, um, here on this wiki page. Right, so next, um, we're going to consider Zen as an attack surface. Okay, so um, what interface does 
is then have for atrium guests. Okay, so we have the atrium hypercalls, which are a smaller subset of the PV hypercalls. Um, we have instruction emulation. So um, all of the MMIO that is done by Hensloff QMU is emulated by Zen. Um, and the, uh, if you're not running with HAP, you may be running shadow page tables, and that's emulation. Zen also emulates a number of platform devices, which need to be emulated for um, speed reasons, uh, performance reasons, so the APIC, HPET, and the PIT. Um, and additionally, you may have features enabled like nested virtualization, which allows things like um, the Windows XP compatibility mode to be run in Windows 7. So as far as PV guests go, they only have the PV hypercalls. So there's a few more hypercalls than the HVM guests. Um, but it doesn't have a very limited, much more limited set of instruction emulations um, and no emulated platform devices. Um, however, looking over the, as I did a survey of, of the vulnerabilities, there is one thing that PV guests have, which HVMs don't, which is that they share the address space with the kernel. And this means that a lot of um, bugs which would potentially be exploitable in HVM are not, um, that are somewhat exploitable in, in PV. And so as it turns out, when I kind of classified all the different bugs into um, denial of service, um, uh, host crash, um, information linkage, and um, exploitable you know, privilege gaining vulnerability, they basically look statistically very similar. They're all very low, okay? But there's only a hand, like a, um, maybe one or two difference for all of them. So, um, however, as we said, uh, HVM domains do have QEMU. And so uh, if you can't use stub domains for whatever reason, then um, you should use PVVMs. But if you are using stub domains, then either PV or HVM should be about equally, um, e equally secure. <clears throat> but um, so the next thing feature we're going to talk about is the Flask example policy. So what is Flask? Um, so the um, Zen security module is a set of hooks that allow you to build a plugin security module, just like the Linux security module. Okay, um, and Flask is a framework for XSM, which is developed by the NSA. So basically, it's the it's the Zen equivalent of SE Linux. In fact, it uses basically the same contexts, same concepts as SE Linux, and it uses the same user space tools to compile the um, the policies and, and so on. Um, and basically, what it allows you to do is it, to set a policy to restrict the hypercalls, um, which can be made for a guest, to instruct or enable uh, certain hypercalls. So at a basic level, it allows you to restrict the hypercalls to those needed by a particular guest. Okay? At a more advanced level, it allows you to um, grant fine graven privileges and break down things down into a really um, uh, small subdomains. So this, um, if you're using something like, uh, I think the NSA actually have a, a system and um, Zen Client XT, for instance, uses XSM to break things down into really small levels of, of granularity um, so, that you, so that the system looks much more um, like the minus turret thing, where if you break into, you have control this VM here, and you want to get something over here, you have to break in through several layers of um, several different walls to get where you want to go. Now, that level of um, usage of Flask is far beyond uh, what I can talk about in this um, uh, what I can cover in this, this talk. However, um, there is something called the Flask example policy, which is very straightforward to use. And what it is, it contains example roles for DOM U, DOM 0, stub domains, driver domains, and so on. And basically what it does is it's kind of like this picture here. So if you're wondering what this picture is, this is a picture that I found on lifehacker.net. And the problem it's trying to solve is, if you have a complicated audiovisual system set up with you know, several different remotes with a whole bunch of different buttons on it, and you um, maybe you want to go away for the weekend and want to leave your parents with the kids, um, and <coughs> they come back and they just want to watch TV. But um, in trying to get the whole thing to work, they pressed all these random buttons and misconfigured your system, and now nothing works, and you have to spend an hour sorting things out again. Um, so the suggestion was that you figure out what is it they need to do, right? They want to turn the TV on and off. They want to access the volume. They want to change the channel. That's all my parents wanted to be able to do. So you figure out what they need to do, and you put construction paper over and cover every button that they don't need to use. And then, first of all, that helps them to only use the buttons that need to be used, and it helps you because there's much less chance they're going to be able to do something to misconfigure your system that you're going to have to sort out later. And so the Flask example policy is basically like that, is you have um, a policy that says, you know what, DOM0 needs to use these things, but a DOM, a normal um, VM, doesn't need to use all these hypercalls. This restricts the amount of code that an attacker can light up, which reduces the probability that they're going to be able to find an exploitable bug um, in the 
parts that they can actually access. So um, basically how to set up Flask, so you build Zen with XSM enabled, uh, you compile the example policy, um, and then you add the appropriate label to the guest config files. So um, sec label equals, and then the name of the label, or start on label equals whatever the name of the label. And there's a how-to here, which obviously there's a, much, a lot more to this than um, uh, I can cover in this talk, but there's a how-to with all this stuff here on, the, um, on this wiki page. Oh, sorry, and the last thing, <laughs> um, yeah, the last thing is, every time I give a practice talk, I forgot about this line. Um, <laughs> so we, um, uh, the format three policy is not extensively tested, so the NSA tests it, and we test it intermittently, um, but it's not part of our regular regression testing yet. That's one of the things that we're gonna be working on. So if you decide to use it, the XSM example policies, uh, we strongly suggest that you put it with, in warning mode to begin with, and run it for a couple of weeks to make sure that there's nothing um, that you actually need um, that gets filtered out. Okay. Right. So <clears throat> we have um, given you an overview of the Zen architecture. Uh, we've talked about a, we've given a, a, you a brief introduction of the principles of security analysis, and we've considered some attack services in Zen, and some security features that we have been able to use to make them more secure. Uh, this includes driver domains, PV grub, stub domains. Um, PV and HVM, and the Flask example policy. So hopefully, I've given you, given you tools to think about the security in Zen, um, you know some of the security features of Zen, and you are equipped with the knowledge to get those working. And with that, I will take any questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. What is the relation with the base system? Because on the schema you, you have shown, uh, it's like uh, when you get into the stub domains uh, level, when you enter it, mm -hmm. uh, then you told that there are interfaces on the on dom zero yet. Uh, what is the relation between them? What can be accessed? Like the backend can be accessed afterward? Or? So let me see. It's like 10 slides before, I know, but it's it. No, no, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Um, let me see if I can understand it. Um, so you're asking about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Now, now you're exploiting the stub domain. So yes. Oh, yes, yes. So, um, so the question is what, I, I mentioned some interfaces here, so um, PV, PV interfaces. So all I'm saying is, um, so HVM guests and PV guests have access to slightly different interfaces in Zen. Most of it's exactly the same, okay? But there are a handful of hypercalls that PV guests can make that HVM guests can't make. And vice versa, there are a handful of hypercalls which HVM guests can make, which PV guests can't make, okay? So if we're gonna say, um, so hypothetically, let's say that there was, a, there was an exploitable bug in one of these um, hypercalls that um, uh, only PV guests had access to. And hypothetically say that you managed to gain access to um, an HVM domain, but not a PV domain, okay? So now what I'm saying is um, if you could, so then, so I'm an attacker, and I want to. I, I, I know the only um, exploit I found into Zen is this PV hypercall, but the only guess that I have is an HVM hypercall, right? So now I have one exploitable bug, but I can't get to it. All right. So now, um, if I can find a bug in the device model, right? So I have to find a second exploitable bug. Now I exploit the device model, and then now I can exploit the PV interface. Um, so I'm, I'm being really sort of, um, what do you call it, a, a, bit, a, bit, a bit pedantic here, right? But the number of PV interfaces that um, are accessible to PV guests and not to HVM guests are very small. Um, so, yeah, th th like you said, th 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 there's a po pro possibility. Um, there is a possibility there, um, but it's not that much. That, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, that it is, how, how uh, is it easy or not that easy to, um, to, s to configure a environment that is uh, pretty secure, but also it's possible to maintain for people who are not security experts? Um, yeah, I think so. So the question was, is it possible to maintain something which is fairly secure, but not um, easy to maintain for people who are not security experts? Um, and this is kind of what I've been trying, the, the point of this talk actually, um, is to, um, to say that most of these things that I've covered here are actually fairly simple to set up. Um, and the main thing is that, so the thing with driver domains, right, is it would, it, to set those, to have, have those on by default would require a bunch of coordination with the, 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 um, 
uh, with, the, with, the, with the distribution. Does that make sense? Um, and this would be very complicated because you'd have to set it up so that, you know, um, when you installed the Zen, that suddenly it would like create an entirely new VM for you and it would automatically configure the network that you had done, done zero and all this other stuff. It's just, it's just, you know, a fairly complicated thing to set up. So um, um, it would be very easy for someone to create a Zen-based distro that had all this stuff on by, by default, right? So you, you could make a Debian or Ubuntu or Fedora spin that had all these things enabled by, by default. And in fact, um, so Zen server is going towards that. So if you search for, um, uh, or Project Windsor, I think that is, uh, Zen server Project Windsor, you, you, you'll, you'll see that um, Zen server itself is, is um, working towards what they call disaggregation, which is, again, this level of, and rather than having, so one of the things we've seen a lot of times is you know, this thing where everything is running in domain zero, any exploit gives you control of the whole system, right? And so um, the, the Zen server is working towards being able to break that up into little tiny chunks um, so that, again, in order to, if you break into one of those little chunks, it doesn't actually buy you that much. Um, and so we expect sometime in the maybe next, um, when you just say, Lars, maybe next year and a half, two years, possibly, um, that we would have, um, that Zen server may have this, this kind of thing. Um, and Zen server, open, I mean, Zen server now is a fully open source. You can use that. Or it'd be fairly easy for someone to um, take a Debian or Fedora or one of these things and, and make a spin that has the stuff on by default. Or um, um, to take an existing distro um, and just do a couple of little tweaks, like I've said here, and make it quite a bit more secure. Does that answer your question? Right. Um, <laughs> Um, for the most part, the disaggregation stuff, so the, the stuff of putting things in separate domains, um, make things more scalable and um, makes them faster, right? So if you have, if you have all of the, your QMU stuff running in domain zero, that means that you have to have um, a domain, you have to have, domain zero has to have a access to a, a large number of CPUs. And that means that domain zero itself um, has to have, so all of the locks have to be shared across all of the CPUs. So if you're running, um, uh, if you're running it like a big system with you know um, 128 cores, you may need to have you know um, 32 or 64 cores for domain zero to be able to, to handle all the things. And that makes a lot of lock contention, right? Um, whereas if you break down um, the things into individual subdomains, then each subdomain is its own little tiny thing, and you don't have to have locks across the whole system to to run um, to do a lot of that processing anymore. Um, the same kind of thing happens for a lot of the different systems, um, uh, the, the, the network um, stuff. Now you can have several driver domains, all of which, maybe each of which have their own um, separate network card. Um, and, but because they're separate kernels, then they don't have the same degree of um, spin lock contention and, and so on. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Um, so there's some other people ahead of you. So. Mm. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so you mean as far as, so the question was about inserting the code in the Zen hypervisor. Are you talking about um, uh, like um, in, into, the, into the, the software repository that people then compile and install or? Um, so as, as an attacker, uh, so yeah, so, so, so same as example here, um, you would have to attack through the Zen hypervisor interface into the Zen hypervisor. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so that's kind of what I was dis discussing um, here. Um, so th there is obviously a risk that there's, there's um, going to be exploitable bugs in the, in the interface. Um, and one of the things that you can do to um, so one of the things we, we do try and do is, is make things very simple. Um, and the, one of the things you can do is to use the Flask example policy. Because then what you're doing is, I mean, so it, again, we can't promise there's never going to be any bugs. Um, systems have bugs in them. Um, but if we 
reduce the amount of things an attacker can act, have access to, then it reduces the amount of code that might have a bug in it, which we hope will make it less, prob less probable. Does that, is that what you were asking? OK. Um, I think he was ahead of you. One question. Um, the driver demands, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, it must uh, negative influence the performance, because you have another layer between uh, the DOM, mm -hmm. DOM 0 and, uh, DOM zero and uh, the virtual machine. So the thing is, um, DOM 0 doesn't actually have to, sorry, it's driver domains. That's the disadvantage of this kind of a system. Um, <clears throat> so uh, from Zen's perspective, the driver domain and DOM 0 are exactly the same, right? So it, it's, just, it's just a domain which happens to have access to um, the, the, the hardware. Um, and so the um, performance of the driver domain um, should be basically the same as the performance of DOM 0. Um, right, so so the thing, so if you see here the arrows, so the the the, um, the domains are talking to net, the net fronts are talking to net back, goes through the bridge, through IP tables, through the NIC driver, down to the NIC, and um, DOM zero is not involved. Oh yes, yeah. So the um, so he said the notable distinction is that exclusive access versus shared access. So the driver domain controls the the guest network card directly. So it's issuing MMIOs and, that, and domain zero is now not talking to that network card. So to do that, you have to have two, this is why I said we have two network, uh, two, a control network and a, and a guest network. Um, so the, the DOM zero is still controlling the control network where you tell it to start VMs and things like that. But the guest network is on a physically different card which is given to the driver domain and DOM zero doesn't have anything to do with it anymore. Did you follow on? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I suspect you have to build it your own. Does anyone know if um, Fedora has XSM enabled? Okay, I suspect not. I, I suspect you'll have to rebuild it. Okay. Yeah. So, do you have another? Um, yes, it is. So there are no constraints that's put on the, on the normal functionality from the perspective of security. Yeah, let, let me double, double check this. Yeah, so no, because the, um, as far as the back end, so basically whenever you do a migration, if you're using this the split driver model, um, you have to have a way to go and tell the guest, okay, disconnect from the network interfaces, and then you migrate it, and they say, okay, now connect up again. Um, and um, again, as far as the... Um, um, so it happens that domain zero does most of the, almost always has net, net back in it, right? But the whole system from the very beginning was set up so that it doesn't have to be domain zero, it can be anything. And so when the guest wakes up kind of on the remote side um, and the tool stack says, okay, now connect, um, it just says connect here and that it, it connects to the, the place that the tool stack tells it to and everything just works. Okay, so, so the worst case, for example, of the added another parameter from machine, uh -huh. In this, the subdomain, you mean? Yeah, subdomain. Right. So no, and so in the case of the subdomain, um, you because uh, the, the the state you need is in QMU, and um, so what you do if you're not running a subdomain, whether it's in domain zero or in the subdomain, what you do is you talk to QMU and say now dump your state, and QMU will pickle it up and put it into a, a binary a blob for you, and then you ship that over to the other side, and you make a new QMU. And then you say, okay, QMU, here's your state, read it in, and then it'll load it back up. Um, and so you could, in theory, um, so for instance, if you were running a, um, I think this is the case, again, I haven't actually tried this, right? But in theory, it should be the case that um, you should be able to say, actually, to migrate from um, not using a subdomain to using a subdomain or, or vice versa, because um, in, it, in both cases, you're destroying the old QMU and making a new one. And as long as the new one has the, the state, which is, is the same thing, then it should be fine. That doesn't answer your question. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Lars? Um, one of the things you pointed out was um, uh, you know, Debian doesn't have those images in it. Yeah. Are we, are we working with Debian to get those images? 
Um, yes, it's one of the things we would we would like to do. Um, I forget the. It, um, it has to do with uh, the, the theories about, I mean, the, the, the Debian maintainer and, and what should be in and what shouldn't be in. And, and part of the thing with the subdomain is it has yet an, an extra copy of pvgrub or an extra copy of QEMU, um, this apart from not the, the normal QEMU that, that comes with, um, with Debian. Um, I think that's the, the issue. And so um, it was kind of, it's one of our things to do to try and work that out to, to get it sorted. Um, I'm not sure what the state of that is. That wasn't a, a great answer, but... <laughs> Any other questions? Bye. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>